My topic is um, global climate change and New Zealand forests. You'll notice that the second part of the title is in smaller font. I'm mostly going to talk about the climate change part, not so much about the forest. My colleague from Scion will cover that more effectively than I could, I think. And um, my title slide sort of looks a bit apocalyptic, doesn't it? And I think that the, the point here is this could be a picture of our future. But if we, like you've just heard from Jason, you know, if we all get on the canoes and we all do the paddling and we all work together, we can avoid futures that look like this. And it really is up to us as a species collectively to decide what the future is going to look like. So I really take my hats off to the people in the room who are doing the work to reforest this country um, and just work to reduce our, uh, our load on the atmosphere, our load on the climate system. But anyway, um, let's start by having a look at that. Um, here, here's the problem we face. This is the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, over the last 13,000 years. So most of the numbers that come on this graph, you've got time along the bottom axis and the concentration of CO2 up the vertical axis. Most of the data comes from ice cores, it's just the blue part, uh, from the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii the last 60 years or so. And you can see when the Industrial Revolution started, right? With the graph sort of hovering along at about 280 parts per million and then we started burning coal to power steam engines, etc. and Carbon dioxide is a problem, is the problem, because it stays in the atmosphere for so long, for centuries and centuries. So once you emit it, it just builds up, and so you end up with this huge spike in the concentration. And carbon dioxide, along with the other greenhouse gases, you know, they, they act like a, a duvet on a bed at night. You put a duvet over yourself, your body emits infrared radiation, just like the Earth emits infrared. That duvet will capture some of that and keep you warmer underneath uh, than you would be if you didn't have the duvet. And having these gases in the air, it's the same idea. What's underneath, that is the surface of the Earth, warms up. If you add more of the stuff to the air, it's like putting a thicker duvet on the whole Earth. And we've certainly thickened the duvet a lot lately. So we're now at a point where there's about, well, there's more CO2 in the air than there has been for three million years roughly speaking. So it's, it's an unprecedented um, place we're in as a species. This is, you know, three million years ago, Homo sapiens didn't exist. But the, the factoid about this that really still staggers me is that half of that rise has happened in roughly the last 30 years. So in the time the United Nations has set up the COP meetings and we've been talking about how to fix it and the IPCC has been working on understanding the problem, we've actually made the problem twice as bad as it was before. Um, so a bit of a shame, <laughs> bugger, but you know we're, we're, we are now really in a difficult situation and we really do have to work hard. If we'd started back in 1990 it wouldn't be so dire. But anyway, um, just to summarise quickly some of the, the sort of state of the play, the latest IPCC report, uh, a couple of headlines. So unsurprisingly, we can say that recent changes in the climate are widespread, rapid and intensifying. And certainly that last part, unprecedented in thousands of years. Um, things are changing rapidly and this hasn't happened for a very long time. Maybe it's never happened at the rate that it's happening now. Um, climate change is affecting every region on Earth in multiple ways, so, you know, there's no free passes. Um, and obviously, again, as it warms further, we'll, we'll experience um, bigger changes. So just to look at how temperatures are changing, um, this is global average temperature. Each bar on this graph is uh, a year, and it's averaged around the globe. So we've got time starting in 1880 now, and the vertical scale is temperature. The zero line is uh, an estimate of the pre-industrial temperature. It's just the average before 1900, so it's not quite back to the pre-industrial. And you can see, yeah, the last um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years, actually, if we put what we've got of 2022 so far onto that graph, it would also sit above one degree. So I think it's safe to say that we're, we've had the last eight years have been more than a degree above the pre-industrial temperature. And um, obviously as we're adding 
these gases to the atmosphere faster and faster over time, the rate of warming has increased a lot. So about a bit over a degree of warming uh, in the last century or so. And when you look at this country, here's the same kind of graph for just averaged over Aotearoa. It, it looks noisier because it's a much smaller area. There's all sorts of other, you know, noise going on with El Nino events and things, that some of which get averaged out when you look globally. So um, over this country, though, you can see, again, we're going from, well, only from 1908 is the start, not 1880, uh, through to last year. And last year was the warmest year on record in this country. And if you fit a straight line to those numbers, which doesn't make a lot of sense because it's not a very linear change, but if you do, you get a trend of about 1.2 degrees over 100 years. So it's roughly the same as the, the global average. OK. Um, yeah, I guess just, just another point on this. Um, it's, it isn't a linear change, really, not when you look locally, especially. It's more about counting the blue bars versus the, the red bars, and I should have said the zero line on this graph is not the pre-industrial temperature, it's the 1981 to 2010 average. And the last few years are all in the red zone, and the first few years are all in the blue zone. So the chances of getting a warm year are increasing all the time. The chances of getting a cold year are decreasing all the time. And when you look on shorter timescales, on days and months, it's really about the chances of getting a, a very hot event, uh, extreme high temperatures, or the chances of getting a, a very heavy rainfall event and so on that are really impacting both ecosystems and, and human activity. So it's, it's how extremes are changing that's really important. Uh, another statement from the IPCC, indisputable that human activities are causing climate change. Well, that's true if, you, if you're not sure about that. You can talk to me later. Um, and like I was just saying, it's making extreme climate events, including heat waves, heavy rainfall and droughts, more frequent and severe. And these are the things that really affect us and affect forests and ecosystems. So just to get a bit nerdy for a sec, to go through what's going on with these extremes. Um, for temperatures, um, this is a schematic drawn by my colleague Andy Reisinger a few years ago. So the, the curve here shows a distribution of temperatures. Um, and you, as you go up the curve, you, you find the most commonly occurring temperatures, which for this distribution happen to be the average. So you get those sort of temperatures most of the time. But at the tails, you've got the very cold events and the very warm events. Um, and those are, those are the things you notice and you remember, probably. So what's happening with climate change is that whole distribution is being pushed to the warm side. It's, everything's warming up. The change in the mean temperature might not look that great, you know, one degree. You're still well within the normal range of what you experience from one day or one year to the next. But you can see the area under the curve beyond your threshold for hot days or hot years that goes up a lot. It goes up much faster than that, what appears to be going on with the average temperature change. And you start getting into that red region um, at the far end um, where you're getting unprecedented high temperatures. And the narrower your distribution, the faster all this happens. Now, I think it's, it's one sort of advantage we have in Aotearoa. The distribution's quite wide. It's quite a noisy place in terms of the climate. So you've got to push a bit harder here to really feel those extreme high temperatures than you might do in a place like Australia, for instance. But anyway, in either case, we're seeing a rapid change in extremes um, and new unprecedented high temperatures. But at the same time, the, the frosts, the cold extremes, are becoming much less frequent. And that's... Uh, some people might see that as good news, but it is not good news in a lot of ways in terms of, it, you know, if we're thinking about um, cropping um, pip fruit, stone fruit, there's a lot of plants that need cooling in the winter so that they reset their clock and, and um, produce fruit in the summer. And if you don't have those cold uh, events, then, then you're under trouble. So it's not necessarily all good news at that end. All right, and for rainfall, it, it's, it's a little bit more complex. I don't have a nice diagram, but um, it's, it's quite amazing. Rainfall is very lumpy. It, it happens in short bursts, and it's an amazing statistic that on average around the world, half of the annual rainfall in a place falls just on 12 days. Um, that's, I've done some of the numbers for this country. It, it works in some places, but not in others, so I won't, won't go into that. But on an average around the world, that's the statistic. And as temperatures rise, 
the number of days decreases. This is basically what's happening. So the amount of moisture in the air is, is just a function of temperature, warmer air, more moisture. So when there's a way to get moisture out of the sky, a storm, you're much more likely to get heavy rainfall. And heavy, again, heavier rainfall than you may have experienced before. And that goes along with floods and slips and all the rest of it. But when it's not raining and the sun's shining, evaporation in a warmer climate is going to work faster and you're going to dry things out more quickly and you can get into drought conditions um, faster. So you can end up with more extremes at both ends of the scale and the sort of moderate rain days are gradually getting squeezed out and you get big dumps on some days and then long dry spells and droughts in between. So I think with rainfall, the message is really more variability and even if you're not seeing a change in the average amount of rain in your location. Okay, what about the future? Here's my uh, thicker duvet on, on the earth again. This is the CO2 concentration graph. So the question is how much higher is that going to get? How quickly can we stop the rise? So we know that this amount of CO2 gives us about 1.1 degrees of warming globally on average, and you can work out it's quite straightforward, you know, how long would it take at the current rates of emission to get to other thresholds. So we'll be at 1.5 degrees in 10 years, roughly, and there's a United Nations Environment Report that came out just this week saying, you know, we can't really stop that, although if some miraculous canoe paddling happened in the next five years, maybe, but I think it's pretty much locked in. And then Ten years later, we'd be at two degrees of warming. Another 30 years, 25, 30 years later again, we'd be at three degrees of warming. And this is all well before the end of this century. And, you know, we'd be massively melting ice in Antarctica and all the rest of it by three degrees of warming. So we had better get on and fix this problem. What we need to do, if we, if we could still stop at one and a half degrees, uh, we're talking about a 50% reduction in emissions this decade and a 100% reduction like no emissions, no net emissions of carbon dioxide by 2050. And this is where trees obviously play a big role. Um, they can sequester, they're the only technology we have really that can sequester this stuff on a global scale. So the question is, you know, these sort of targets, can we actually achieve them? Can we do it? But either way, you know, whatever happens, you know, this decade, Absolutely, this decade has to be the decade of action. And the latest statement from the IPCC, I think, is global emissions have to peak before 2025, which is, given that's nearly the end of 2022, is not far away. Okay, in this country, uh, a couple of maps are getting a little bit old now, but still roughly consistent with the latest uh, model results. The map on the left, temperature change, this is for a sort of Globally average temperature rise of a bit more than two degrees. Uh, we have about two degrees of warming over the country, a bit more in the north than the south. And on the right, change in precipitation. The blue colours mean more precipitation, 10% or so more. And the red colours less, 5 to 10% less. So increasing the east-west gradient in, in wetness, the wetter getting wetter and the dry get drier, uh, while temperatures are rising pretty uniformly. But in both cases, we see rapid increase in extremes. So for a two degree warming in this country, we're talking about roughly three times as many hot days, whatever you want to call a hot day where you live. Um, in the drier places, add a reduction in, pre in precipitation of five to 10%, and you get roughly a tripling of the occurrence of droughts. Put that together with um, higher temperatures, etc., and you get roughly a two to three times extension in the length of the fire season, that is the period in which you're in a very higher extreme fire danger. Now there was some interesting work done recently on this, looking, uh, looking at uh, high resolution climate information over the country and different, these different scenarios for the future um, by Nathaniel Media et al. And uh, the maps here show for the different futures for greenhouse gas emissions, basically from, from the sort of Paris Agreement on the left hand end to the just go crazy and burn everything at the right hand end. And you can see that sort of yellow, uh, yellowish region in South Canterbury and Otago uh, where the fire danger is highest. So big expansion in the region of um, high fire dangers in the east of the South Island, especially in parts of the eastern North Island. Um, 
So yeah, I get the question is, you know, the, the future hasn't been decided yet. Which end of the scale are we going to be at? Ideally, actually off the left-hand end and, and below uh, the two-degree warming, well below the two-degree warming. So um, yeah, just the message that surely the fire danger is increasing as the climate gets warmer. And I think one of the other major issues for trees is the climate change changes, and one of the big examples is the, the pine bark beetle in North America. What's happening with pest species? So the, the pine bark beetle is um, native to the North American continent, but as things have warmed up, it's been able to extend its, its range, and it's killed off huge swathes of trees across Canada and, and northern US, as shown in the, the picture here. And I'm not so sure about, I think, according to the, the MPI website, this is a map of the uh, sort of suitability of the climate for pine bark beetles at the moment. Uh, and all of the country is, is OK. It's better in the south than the north. So I'm not, I, the pine bark beetle isn't here as far as I know. But if some of these pests were able to be introduced or flew here or, or whatever happened, um, as the climate warms up, I think, we will have a, a more suitable environment for letting these things flourish and do damage to our all sorts of ecosystems. Okay, just to finish off, I talk. I put my uh, climate change commission hat on for a sec. Um, what about trees and greenhouse gas emissions and the emissions reduction plan? Uh, so this is a picture from the advice that the climate change commission produced last year. Uh, and the green line on this graph is gross emissions of carbon dioxide. This is just long-lived gases, just CO2 essentially. And the blue line is the net emissions, so the, the gap, the difference is the sequestration through forestry essentially. And you can see, you know, if we follow the advice, and the government has pretty much gone along with the, the advice and their plan, uh, the, the blue dashed line goes down and the target is that square at the bottom right, um, zero net emissions by 2050. You get to, get to zero well before 2050, actually. Um, so that's good news. Um, if you heard Rod Carr yesterday, you'll know um, the Commission is very keen to see gross emissions come down. That has to happen because there's just not enough hectares to plant trees on globally. We can't plant our way out of the problem. But... Um, offsets through tree planting buy us some time, so it's a really good thing to be doing, at least in the short to medium term. Um, so a, a picture of what this is, again, from the detail of the advice, if you had a look at the report last year. So what's shown on this graph, we've got the past on the left-hand side of the dashed vertical line and the future on the right out to 2035. And the orange shows exotic afforestation and the purple is native afforestation, and it's maybe not totally obvious <laughs> there, but if you look further out, out to 2050, the idea is that in the short term, uh, exotics give you uh, a good bang for your buck in terms of emissions reductions um, now, but we really need to move to be planting natives that, as Rod said yesterday, you know, it's net zero emission in 2050 and every year thereafter, you've got to have a way of locking that in. And native forest is a good way of, you know, a good part of that story. So exotic forest planting now could dominate, but native forest planting later, and what I mean by later, well, as soon as possible actually, but um, yeah, certainly by the middle of the century. Um, and we have to reduce gross emissions though in the longer term. We can't rely on trees completely. So, um, so yeah, but in the short term, that is over the next 50 years or so, I'd say tree planting is, is a great thing to be doing. All right, just to wrap up. So the climate's changing fast, I mean really fast, and it's, it's all down to us. You know, we are doing this. Uh, we are adding these gases to the atmosphere. We've got all the power to keep doing it or to stop doing it. I appreciate it. it means we've got to reconfigure how energy is generated for the global economy. It's not straightforward. But it's up to us as to what future we choose. This country, in, in some ways at least, is, is changing at about the global rate. We're seeing temperature extremes becoming more common, etc., etc. Um, afforestation can really help offset greenhouse gas emissions. We've got to be reducing those, but we can 
buy ourselves some time at least by planting trees. But then as we're planting them, we need to be thinking about what are the future uh, hazards going to be in terms of fire, in terms of pest, in terms of storm damage and so on. But yeah, my, my last point, we do need, we really, I'm not making this up, we really do need urgent <laughs> reductions in emissions ASAP if we're going to stop warming at even less than two degrees C. So let's get out there and do it. Thank you very much. Thank you.